Hey folks, my name is Pisi Timmy and you're welcome to another episode of Founders Connect. On this show, I have conversations with amazing entrepreneurs and operators in Africa. On today's segment, we're having a conversation with Adetola. You know him as Adetola V on social media, but his full name is Adetola Onayemi and he's the founder and CEO of Nori Biz. It promised to be a very exciting conversation. We've had like back-end chat and he's like lots of vibes and he has an amazing career history. So especially for people who are coming from like a professional background, like study law, study medicine or something really professional now and then dived into tech i think this conversation will be very relevant to you so make sure you stay and watch this video to the end i'll see you peace welcome to my youtube channel i'm pc timmy a change maker professional and creative who is passionate about growing people and growing businesses like comment subscribe to my channel and please always share my videos it promises to always be impactful and insightful Hi Tola. What's up? How you doing? Good. Yeah? Yeah. How's the London weather treating you? It makes sense why British people speak a lot about the weather, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. I know, like it was never a thing for me and I moved here and I realized, yeah, it's a yeah. thing because whenever you come outside, you actively have yeah, to think yeah. about it. So I, I did about my education here and um, yeah, so yeah, it's just a trend to see that it's a bit worse because like <laughs> it's April. It's April worse. <laughs> yeah, it's April and it's still like, um, the weather is still this great, but it's yeah. what it is, right? Okay, cool. Now, you mentioned your education, so let's talk about your background. Just like, tell me about growing up. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? What was, a, was your favorite memory growing up as well? Growing up was really fun. Um, I think I have the best parents in the world, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so the thing is that I think I grew up like with a lot of love and like um, a very grounding. So I think that I, I think I took that for granted a lot. Right? I think hmm. growing up years after I realized, oh, that's not normal for most people. Like <laughs> you don't have your parents who go crazy on your behalf. Like yeah. Right. So like I, I so I grew up with a lot of love. Um, I think a lot of my critical thinking as a person came from the house. So my parents were like crazy about books, right? So hmm. we had books everywhere in the house. Like we used to play a joke as kids called first to read. So my dad bought a new newspaper in every day. The first one to shout first to read was one that I read the newspaper paper first among all the kids. Wow, yeah, how many so, siblings do you have? Um, two brothers, so okay. three of us, yeah. Um, and then we, my, my parents were crazy in love, still crazy in love. My parents eat dinner together every day, you know, so, and we all used to have like family dinners. Um, so, and then that family dinner was like time for like a lot of debate, right? So okay. like, so like you could discuss everything from politics to finance to medicine, like it was a, and also, I think my parents thought we were going to all be medical doctors. Like, <laughs> Are you medical doctors? No, only my younger brother. My younger brother's okay. a medical doctor. Um, the oh, were your parents? No, no, they were not. My parents were both um, accountants. Okay. Yeah, but they wanted to be medical doctors and didn't. So, and they tried to they tried to ship the idea into our heads, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but um. But yeah, so I, I grew up with a lot of love. Um, had a lot of fun growing up. Um, I remember one one of my favorite memories of playing football with my dad, right? And for context, my dad doesn't play football. Right? So, <laughs> but like, I remember one day I'd come back. We had gone to like a, a reunion thing with his classmates, and we had bought a ball. And then we got back home, and we had like a big compound. My dad was like the extreme end of the compound, and we started playing football. One of my fondest memories of like growing up. Uh, what city did you grow up in? Um, Lagos mostly. So I I was in the bad place, but like Lagos mostly was where I grew up. Um, yeah, my dad at some point went to do something at South Middle University in the US, but like most of them growing up was in Lagos. So what schools did you go to? Okay, um, everywhere, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I did most of my uh, primary education in the same place, it's called Mayday School um, in okay. Lagos. Uh, I still have fond memories of driving to school. Um, and you used to drive to school? Yeah, my parents used to go drop us off in school. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I thought you were driving no, yourself. No, 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 no. I, I used to be at the back. I used to be like, this, you know that special space where you can look right at the AC? I used to be like, <laughs> yeah. I used to be sitting there like on, on the way to like um, school. And yeah, and went to media school, um, had like a pretty, pretty solid background. Um, I think towards the end of my primary education, I had like a, had like a surgery incident. So I had appendicitis oh. and that's when I knew my parents, my dad loved me. So, so, you know, <laughs> so growing up, yeah, so growing up, you know how you always, like your parents are tough on you a bit. Yeah. So you always, you always say, oh, it's people don't love me. Remember this incident where I had a, I, I, so I, 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 no, I didn't used to eat, right? So I hated, um, gosh, I hated packaged food. My parents were, my parents used, my mom particularly would buy us fruit and food and pack it. She didn't believe in giving us money, but she'd mm. get us all the food you could get, right? So to get tools. So what I used to trade it in, right? I find, <laughs> I, had, yeah, I had people in school who didn't like, who two friends and like used to give them food. So I'll take money from them and I'll sell my food to them. Mm. So I used to have a lot of cash. Um, and yeah, my first chance in business. But um, so I used to have a lot of cash. But what happened was all, if I couldn't eat it, I'll turn over the food at the end of the day into the bin. Cause like, the, I hated when the food was all frozen cause of it was yeah. like flax and all that. And so my parents, my parents are like, moms are like, 
witches. They know all these things. <laughs> my mom knew that um, I wasn't eating, did, yeah. but she never said anything. So I, I started having this abdo abdominal pain. And she, I think she assumed it was ulcer. And she was, wet. she was going to go get it treated. But it was night. I think that day was about 1 a.m. or something. And my dad had just come back like around 12-ish. And I was in crazy pain. And my dad dropped me into the car and raced down. Like it was like <laughs> need for speed driving. I remember it very clearly. One of my favorite um, times when I, oh, when I remember it, I'm like, this yeah, man is crazy me. about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that happened. Um, and yeah, so so went to media school, um, and then from there went to international school battle, um, mm. ISI, um, for my like. Um, education, um, right? Um, I didn't spend too long in ISI. But the good thing was I didn't do a lot of chores in ISI because I, I used my surgery <laughs> as an excuse. <laughs> yeah, I used my surgery for an excuse. It was body now, so I used yeah. my surgery for an excuse for most of it. I, I was like, oh, I had, I had oppression. So, so this called me, yeah, so this nickname your oppression. <laughs> Back in like my, my in, in, in secondary school. And, and then from there I moved on to like Ronick, um, which is back in Lagos. Um, yeah, um, I had a pretty great so education. So during high school, you probably moved like three schools, media, ISI, and then... The media was like primary, primary school, but I, the, at university, and secondary school was two schools. Was two schools. Yeah, and, and most of it was, and I, and I had a pretty smooth background. Like, um, I was in like honors roll every time, um, one of those. Yeah, I, 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 you guys like to read books in your house. Yeah, so. like where, and the thing also was, which is weird, was that I, I think I also realized you could finesse your way through life a lot. <laughs> because <laughs> like, mean? so, because I knew a lot of words. I'd read, like, I'd read all my life, right? I knew mm. a lot of words and I knew a lot of concepts and I'd read books a lot so I understood how the world worked right and that was not popular for people that age so I remember one particular class my class my, one of my friends they make us makes a joke about it, it was economics it was SS1 right so and at SS1 I didn't know what I wanted to do I loved art courses I found science courses just as easy I found commercial courses as easy so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do right I was pretty confused but I was still doing economics and I was in science class and I remember that in SS1 the lecturer had asked us for inflation what was inflation and nobody was like first class no one knew it and I think I gave everybody in the class a definition, a different definition. Like everyone in the class, yeah. Like if they can make a joke, like so I'm like, because it was just words, right? I just mm. I just knew what it was. So I just used the words, change the words, and I'm like, you and use then... this definition, you use this definition. <laughs> and I gave everyone in the class one definition. So it was pretty cool, like growing up. Um, yeah. So uh, that's what most. But then I think closer to the end of secondary school, I was already in science class. You know, the, mm. the assumption in Nigeria is that you, you, you go to science yeah. class, yeah. But then I went for this model UN conference. And at the Model UN conference, I just fell in love with this idea of international law and mm. how you could do international politics. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just switch to like arts. Now, I was like, one just of the best. Just because of that one experience. Yeah, that one. It was like, I think it was SS2. Now, for context, I already had a science degree result already. Because you know, in Nigeria, yeah. like, you know, SS2, you go write like these exams that like, yeah. so I already had like this full science stack of it, the results. Mm. So I could go to university already, right? In fact, my parents were trying to keep me from going because in, in second, in primary, in second, in primary school, also, I jumped right into secondary school. So this, this time, they were like, like, you know, calm down. <laughs> yeah, because I was really young. I was like yeah. almost 15 or 14 or something. Yeah. I was like, yeah. And um, I think what then happened, and I thought I was going to go abroad, but then, yeah. And two incidents changed that. So first, was, so I decided I was going to change. Um, I decided I was going to change um, to, 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 to like yeah, to art class to do law. Um, and then the principal wasn't having it, right? I so said, I think I went home and told my parents, I'm like, listen, I want to change. I'm like, one is, I already have this degree already. Like, I already have like a, a result for like science. So mm -hmm. if I choose to change my mind in the end, I'm fine. But like, mm -hmm. I really want to go to art class. My dad, like, you know what? And that's one thing my parents were cool at. Like, they allowed us to be whatever I wanted to be. So they allowed me to switch, um, went to art class. I think the test was that I had to leave the top of the class. I think I changed like <laughs> a few days to exam. Where? And the, the, what if I didn't talk the class, I had to go back to science class and I talked the class, so they had to let me be. Um, so that was like pretty, pretty cool. Um, then second thing that happened was I got into a bit of trouble in like SS3. It wasn't, and so it was something that, and, and I think that's also one of the reasons I'm very strong on like justice. So what happened basically was that uh, there was this incident where a student had gotten bullied. Now I was there when it was happening. Like, so for context, it wasn't like going to bully. It was like it was SS2, SS3 rivalry, right? So I think there was someone, I was in SS3 by this time. There was someone in SS3 who had had an incident where I think he had stayed behind and SS2 boys had bullied him. Right. right? So like when my classmates came back, they were all pissed that the SS2 boys were trying to punch them. And I saw one of it happen, but I just ignored it. I kept it moving. But like for context, I've been the star student in schools and debates. I was in debate from like so GS2. Boy as well. no, I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, um, I was like debates, blah, blah, blah. And so what happened was, was, there was this whole saga happening, and in, in a way to get himself, so they all got into trouble for like bullying this kid, SS2 mm. kids. In a way to get himself out of the trouble, they mentioned my name as one of the people that were there. And I went to principal's office and I'm like, listen, I was not yeah. part of this. But like, they weren't having it, right? They like, it was simply your name was mentioned, your name was mentioned. I would never, one of the 
fundamentally most annoying incidents of my life. So I was suspended mm. from like body nails. Wow. And I was so pissed because I'm like, I did not okay. do anything. Yeah. Like I didn't touch anyone, right? Like and I wasn't there. So it was, it was one of my worst like experiences. And I think it just made me also now I wanted to go do law mm. a lot more. Uh, yeah, and that was it. And then school finished. Had my, I had like all, um, all A's, I think. Um, like why? Can but I still. That was so. The thing was, I think it was finessing, right? Like, I don't know. If it was, yeah, I don't know. If it was scholarly. I just think it was finesse. Like, what I learned early was knowing what was required to like get the results you wanted to get. Like, mm. people wanted to use words, use words. Like, people wanted you to write. Like, a good luck chunk of the world is using words, right? Like, mm. because like. People have no way to deconstruct how you think or whether you know anything, right? So like, yeah. a good chunk of it is just words, yes, right? right? And so like, getting a mastery of how words work and how emotions work, just like give you massive urge in life. And you right? learned that while you were still in secondary school? Yeah, secondary school and like on my parents' like dining table, because we did it a lot. <laughs> like, you have to debate every time. Like, because yeah. the thing is like, in my parents' dining table, like it was three boys, my parents, my mom and my dad. And like everyone was, it was for context also, my, I grew up in a house where, it was a flat structure. Like we used to vote on decisions. <laughs> Sounds like a startup. Yeah, yeah, like we used to vote on decisions. Like, like, like if my parents wanted to go do something, like I knew everything that my parents' finances. Like mm. as a secondary school student, like I knew my mom had a big. My mom had one of the big first glow shops. Like going global conference yeah. launch in Nigeria. Like she, I was running the thing in my spare. Like in, during the break. Like so, like I had this whole rounded thing where I was a debate person in school. I was running business with my parents at home. I knew what the finances looked like. Like my parents didn't have. Like my parents was doing. I remember when my dad took a loan. One big loan because my parents, my dad used to import. At some point, he used to import in barbed wires and explosives yeah. for like limestones. And, and I remember clearly when they went to take a loan, and I thought we we're going to lose our house because like the house was a lot collateral. And I was like, we're going to lose our house. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad sat me down, like, listen, this is how collaterals work. Right. You know, like, and I was like, yeah. in secondary school, like, yeah. so like that helped a lot because they treated us like adults, right? Yeah. So it helped a lot with like how I saw the world. So, like, and so approaching the world, I already saw the world in a lot different ways. Yeah, just, that makes yeah. sense. So when you talk about your second school, you mentioned that very annoying incident about yeah. like you not being there, but then people saying you're there, and the modern you and made you change to law. Yeah. When you didn't move to university, what would you say was like probably one or two critical experiences that also then added to what you already had? So I think the first incident. So the, the, so when I went to secondary school, right? I got to secondary school really early. I think about 15, 16 or something. Um, into into university. university. Yeah, yeah. You know, 15, 16. Um, so the thing is, there was this. I, I studied law, right? So I was going, supposed to go abroad, but like because of the whole instant suspension, my parents were like, no, I just stick to law. <laughs> right? So so I ended up in University of Lagos. But the thing was that there was a general penchant in University of Lagos, right? Law, right? Like no one finishes the first class. Like first class are like very rare occurrences. People don't have first class in law generally, right? So, but the best shot you have at it is that in your first year you even get a first class right mm -hmm. at least that gives you a chance yeah now so my first year i think i had a pretty okay grade i had like maybe a 4.5 or 4.5 but it was not as fantastic right it was normal like I mean, 4.5 is fantastic yeah but like class. the thing is yeah but like the thing is a lot of people in the class had like crazy up fantastic grades right. like a lot of 4.8 4.9 i was just right. like normal like i was like i knew i was smart but like but you're not uh, yeah, I was time. like, yeah. yeah, like the thing also, there was no way to know stats then. We're just starting school, right? Mm -hmm. So I just I just wrote my exams. Yeah, so I'd, I'd written the exams and there was this whole idea of you had to have like a super grade in like your first year. I Man, I had like okay ones, but like it wasn't like dramatically fantastic. But I think what happened was like the second year, I when when the second year is about to resume, start, right? I moved into the I moved into the uni into school a lot faster because like I had accommodation already. Like I was staying in the BQ for the second year. Right. So I'd moved in earlier than most people. So most people still had to be commuting, trying to get allocations. But the thing was, I just, so I was bored most of the time. So I just spent time reading the whole course. <laughs> like I just read the whole course, the whole school course, right? Yeah, whatever. Like for the entire year? Yeah, for the entire year. Just read it like leisurely. It was more of a, oh, it's law. And you think also like when you're doing law in, in, in Nigeria, right? Like the second year is like when you start doing proper law. Like mm. first year is just a lot of like finessing. Yeah. Right, so like, so like I just read the entire syllabus. Just banter, like nothing serious. And it was, I read a light touch, like, okay, this makes sense. We think with laws, which is one reason why I switched laws. My favorite thing about law was that it doesn't exist, right? Like, right now, myself and you, you can like be sitting and looking at each other and it's fine. But like, I can pass a law this man that says it's illegal to do that, and suddenly you can't do it anymore. Like, mm. the law doesn't exist, but That's it commands okay. so much of people's right. behavior, right? So I, I was already fascinated by that. Is it still your favorite that. thing? Yeah, what is it? Is it still your favorite about thing? About law, yeah, about law. It's probably my favorite thing about the law, as law as a thing, right? Like, you can command people's behavior, by just creating this thing that is intangible, right? Yeah. Like, and I think that's also one of the things I like about tech, but we'll get that in a minute. And so, um, so this year, so I just said, you know what? Yeah, we'll, 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 like, I just read it leisurely. Now the exams came that year, and I think results came out, right? And ridiculous things. I went to see the, my results, right? And what happened was, I just glanced the first grade, like, oh, an A, an A. 
and A and A. And I, I wasn't planning for it. So it was like, you know these boards where like the results are there. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, A, okay. A, okay. A, okay. A, okay. I'm like, I had a 5.0. Everyone started shouting, like, it was the best. Yeah, so I had a 5.0. And it just took off from there, right? Because mm. at this point, I think that it became less about me and just became about this idea of this guy has finished the first class, right? Like, so right. I had a lot of, now, and I had, I had a lot of food. And I, so there were not like two camps. So those were like, oh, it's a fluke. He's never going to repeat it. There were people who felt like, oh gosh, this guy's going to do it. it. <laughs> so like, it was weird. Like, so I had, like, I had a particular lecturer. I remember one particular lecturer, Mr. Akintai, a very cool guy, who, and maybe Professor Oye was, like people who just like took a inkling for like, this guy's going to pull it off, right? But I could tell, I read an exam, I could tell, come and meet me in the exam hall and be like, are you okay? Do you want water? <laughs> no, like, it was, yeah, it's really interesting. Like, and, I, and I think that's one of the things also, like, one of my second biggest, like, I think that was my second biggest lesson in like uni is the gift of people, right? I feel mm. like the biggest gain you get in life is like the gift of people, right? Like mm. getting people who just bat for you yeah, or work on your behalf you. is like the craziest thing you can have. Even in building a company, like yeah. just having the gift of people, right? Because what, that's what happened. Even I had classmates, I remember some of them, Yemi, Fermi, Ni, like, um, there's this person, Shegun. Like, who will go right? Who will go to? Because I never used to go to the library. We'll go to the library, they'll summarize their notes, and they'll come and give me like case notes. I'm like, oh, have you seen this? <laughs> Femi, particularly, Femi, I used to have like this perfectly organized notes, and they'll be like, oh, there's this note. Um, have you seen these? Have you seen? And and so what happened? I just went that way, and then I had a first class, right? And, and it was like a rarity. It was like, okay, this mm. guy had a first class in law. And the thing was, that just opened up the entire world. Mm. Because what happened after that? Because first, you're in a class of your own already, right? Yeah. Because like, it's like in the history of like the faculty of law, you could count those whatever at first class, right? So it was like, and I think after we did it, after I did it in a while, it became a lot more easy, it became a lot more replicable. Right. But like it was just the, okay, that happened. And yeah. it just opened up. So for starters, um, after that, I'd gone. So the second crazy incident that happened in uni that just kind of put me on a crazy trajectory was at the end of my final year, so throughout my final, throughout my uni stay, I'd worked, right? Um, I worked at Citibank, I worked at the bank, like internship yeah. did work. But like my final, after, after I finished my final exams, I wanted to go work at a law firm because I'd interned in a lot more law firms, but I didn't feel comfortable about it. And that's another thing I learned, like just follow your gut feelings and your instincts yeah. a lot. So I didn't feel comfortable. I'm like, I don't know why. So I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna pass on it for a while. So I had this lecturer who really liked me, the professor Oye was. So I went to see him in his office. I was like, you know, I'm not quite sure what I want to do next. So he's, so he's like, oh, so I, I just asked him, like, oh, are you looking for like a, a research assistant? He's like, oh yeah, I'm looking for one. I'm like, oh, do you want me to do it for you? He's like, oh sure, come do it. So I started doing like research assistant work for him. Now, during that time period, someone came to his office and asked him, oh, can I, uh, she wanted a recommendation to go to Cambridge, right? right? And then when she came, uh, she, she, when she came to ask her to go to Cambridge, I'm like, you know what? So it, when she left, he called me to his office and said, you totally should apply to Cambridge, you know, like you will get in. Like, I'm like, mm, sure. So I opened the website, read everything. I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I closed it. Then he nominated him to go for this thing called the Kuramo Conference. Then Fashola was still governor and I'd went to, gone for the Kuramo Conference. And when I was at Kuramo Conference, what happened was I'd run into this other person who, who then said the same thing. It was like, you should totally go. She had just, she had, just, she had gone to Cambridge and then gone to Oxford. Um, mm. right? And she was like, Dr. Oduwali. And she's like, you should totally go. So I'm like, you know what? Yeah, maybe I'll go. So I applied. I think I applied a week to the deadline. <laughs> And I went to law school. And then a few days into law school, I got this offer. Um, I got an admission to Cambridge. I'm like, yeah, sure, maybe I'll, I'll look at it, right? And a few days after, I got an offer for like a part scholarship. I'm like, hmm. So I emailed them back saying, so they have this clause in there. And that's one thing I also learned, right, at this point, which is like, like take 100% of the chance that come to you. Just, mm. just take them, right? Because they, they sent me this letter saying, oh, you had gotten an offer for a scholarship, but like, do you want to, there's a way they put it, like, if you got another offer anyway, or you should inform us. Uh -huh. Right, so I emailed them back saying, oh, I haven't gotten an offer yet, but I'm applying for this. Are you guys interested? Now, what I didn't know was that the two companies were trying to merge. Right. It was the Cambridge Trust and the Cambridge Commerce. I can't remember their names now. So I think they, when they saw that email, they reached out to each other and just emailed me like a week after saying, oh, you know, we'll just give you a full scholarship. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so next thing I was on a full, like, so all of law school was a blog because I was just waiting for law school to be, to be done. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, because I'm like, what, what am I doing here? Yeah, yeah. So, so law school finished and I just went to Cambridge for my master's. Um, when I got there, it was pretty straightforward. Um, I didn't know what to do again, as always, right? <laughs> so, I, so I experimented with all the color courses. I thought I was going to go and do commercial law, uh, but then I realized all the best commercial lawyers I knew didn't have like masters. They just like were practicing in real life. Right. So okay, like, it was Cambridge Masters or another law school. Masters. It was, it was masters. Okay. Yeah. So like, you know what? I'm just going to like do like. 
I'm sorry, I, I just said, you know what? I'm going to experiment with something new, which was international law. The idea was, mm. it makes sense to go do a degree in this because, like, this is a new thing, right? Mm. That I don't know em- enough about. Like, I know, I know enough about like commercial law. I could, at least, I could get it in real practice, right? So why do it? So I did international law there, and and that seemed cool. But then two things happened at this point, right? Uh, the first was that, so when you're finishing your your, your um, stay at Cambridge, most people start applying for jobs at big law firms. So I applied right. for a number of law, law firm jobs, and I got into big law firms, two big law firms, right? In the UK. In the UK, right? Two big law, and money was like big, right? Because, <laughs> yeah, right? But like one thing happened: one of my friends didn't get in, right? The, the interesting thing is like there's this whole joke about how when people don't get in, their eyes are a lot clearer, mm. right? So he didn't get in, and he's like, no. The thing is, when you get an offer to do work in a law from the UK, you have to wait two years because it's a two years training contract. Right. So what you, but you have to wait two years for the two years contract to start. Oh. So it's almost like four years, right? So like you wait two years, then and your then training you do contract the for two, and years. two years. So I was going to do it because like it was a great offer, right? But then my friend was like, so we're going to wait four years for our lives to start. I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> and it's weird because he didn't get in, but I got in. Yeah. And, but that was like a profound moment for me. Like, you know what? That's four years. Hmm. If I take a bet on myself for four years, I usually I'm not going to be better than this. So I declined the offer from the two law firms. Hmm. Yeah, and then said, I'm just going to take a bet on myself, right? Now, interestingly, around that time, I didn't know. What were you planning to go do then? I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. I just felt like if I did something for four years, I must have done yeah. something. Like I can't be waiting for four years for my life yeah. to start. Like right. Yeah. No, but at that time, I'd gone. So there was this the same Dr. Duwale person who I'd helped do what yeah, uh, most people do to Cambridge. Yeah. Then I helped her do some research, and she was given up talking like the Hague. So she invited me to come. So I went to the Hague. Now when I was in the Hague. I met this person who has now become like one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Elias, Olufemi Elias. So then he was at the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons in The Hague. And he tells me things like, you know what, you should only come work here, this, 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 this. We talked about it. Yeah, 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 send your documents, da, 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 da. You probably have to join as a, as a staff, staff with some um, intern offer, but you mm. can figure things out, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I ended up in The Hague. So I went back to Nigeria for like a week or so. And like a few days after that, I was in The Hague, right? Like I was, I was in The Hague. And now for crazy fact, and for people don't, that don't know, the Hague is what exactly? In Netherlands. So I was working at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Mm-hmm. Um, it was international law, it was pure international law. It was, And that's why I think it's weird. Like My life has been a lot of serendipity, right? Because it's been one mm-hmm. thing to another in like a natural, easy sequence. I, I think I've never applied for a job in my life. Right, I, I had a CV for the sake of having a CV. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I was either poached or yeah. So I went to OPCW um, at this point, and when I was at the OPCW, it was um, it was basic. So it wasn't always smooth at the beginning, right? Because what happened was at the beginning, I was getting paid because it, was, it started as an internship offer. Yeah. Right? So I was getting paid four hundred and fifty euros, and my rent yeah, my rent was three hundred euros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a mess. And I remember then, I'll go online, like on Facebook, and I'll see all my friends who were back in Nigeria or back in London. I'll be like, what the hell was I thinking? Like, <laughs> why did I decline the offer? Or why did I just go back home? Because, like, everything seems to be having a blast. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was just like, but like things just took up, right? So a lot of things happened then. One was I said, because, like, I started experimenting with international law more. I started writing papers, I started speaking at conferences, started trying to like advise countries. So, and that's within Advice happened. countries. Yeah, so my final year, t- my, my, so when I was finishing at Cambridge, um, I didn't know, okay, to us, when I was in Cambridge, I didn't know what I wanted to write. I wanted to, I knew I wanted to write a thesis, right? And the reason was that I wanted to be sure that my skills were world class. Now, mm. the thing is, one thing about me was, I generally am comfortable with an outcome in the sense that like I wasn't optimizing for get a first class. In my head I was like this I've gone to first class in undergrad. Yeah. Like I was optimizing for having been sure that I was world class. Hmm. Right? Because like, I wanted to know, like I wanted as the idea for me was let me know the gaps I don't have so I can pick up the skills I need to and be right. good at it, right? Um, and so I wanted to write the thesis because the idea was and then I thought I was gonna be like doing either academia or doing like research yeah. or doing like law, whatever it was, but I, I felt like I wanted to know if like, my research skills were world class. And so for that, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go write like a, I'm going to write a thesis in Cambridge. And if they can grade my thesis as an A in Cambridge, then maybe I'm world class. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, but I didn't know what to write on, because like, everything I wanted to write on was, I was very practical also, right? I wanted to write practical things, right? So everybody had this whole theoretical idea, why the law, I'm like, this thing doesn't have any yeah. real life application. So I went to meet one of my lecturers, um, Fantastic guy, and Dr. Enning Grossers can. Um, so he tells me he's, he was doing some work on um, a case we call the U.S. gambling case. It's a case where the U.S. and Antigua and Barbuda 
uh, had like an incident and the case went to the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Right. So he says, I'm he interested in working on this, right? If you do, I'll give you a shitload of material and you would actually have like real life experience. Mm. I'm like, you know what, I'll do it. So that was my first experience with like real country type mm. situations. And it was like fantastic. I had an A, of course, in the thesis. But, <laughs> yeah, the of course. Is, of course, the <laughs> but the point was that like kind of opened up the idea that you could actually negotiate for countries and advise countries. Mm. And so I, I started experimenting after that. Like, so I started doing things like, so I had a class, and the good thing with Cambridge also is that a lot of people come in there. I was really young when I went to Cambridge. I was like stupidly young. Cause like, and that's like the thing, 20, right? 21. Yeah, 20, 20, 21, yeah. So, but like I, all, everybody was coming that either worked for years in their home country, mm. they were older. So I had a lot of classmates who were from different countries. In all that. And the thing also was, that's another thing also that I always had going for me, even back in undergrad, right? Was that I was very pro make all kinds of friends in like other fields. Mm. But that's how I got into tech, right? Because what happened at the time I went to Cambridge was that at that time the tech scene in Nigeria was taking off. Mm. Right? This was around 2013. It was really taking off. But like, most of these people didn't have like lawyers, because like lawyers were very expensive. Yeah. But as an undergrad student, right? And most of them would come to me and tell me things like, Tola, could you help me put this agreement together? Tola. So I started doing a lot of so I started making a lot of money, um, like advising like tech bros of that time, <laughs> right? Or like putting together agreements, yeah. putting together like paperwork, helping like do like so and most of the we, we didn't have there was no templates, right? So I had to read yeah. most of them download templates online, start trying to try and understand the template. Sometimes I would run it by a lecture. So I'll go to class and I'll ask the lecturer and just try to explain them. Nah, that makes and sense. I'm not applying that. <laughs> yeah, so there's all of that stuff. So that's how I started getting involved in tech a bit, right? And, and I, think, I think that's why I got my first set of stocks, all those kind of things. I right? got a lot in, involved in like tech, that's like 2013. Um, but then I was then went to work at the UN, um, the OPSW, which is like a UN affiliate organization. Um, but then I started advising countries, right? So there was a bunch of classmates who had incidents with countries who was say, listen, come. So I'll fly down to their countries right. and advise, uh, right? Put together papers, economic policy. And the thing was, the lines were blurry. The lines of law and economics were all blurry. Because sometimes mm. it would be, oh, I was the economic policy for this country. Now, around that time was when the current president, Buhari, won his election, right? And now for context, I'd known the vice president a bit before then because another mental figure of mine, and by the way, that's another big thing, that was a big feature of my life. Yeah, I can mental see it, figures. yeah. Yeah, um, and yeah, so um, Dr. Um, Mr. Tsunay Rukera, who is now the head of the, IC, um, the ICPC, uh, no, not the ICPC, what am I saying? The, FCCPC, the Federal Consumer Protection right. um, um, Agency, yeah. So like, he, he was like a mental figure, and I'd gone to see him. He was then partners with like the vice president in like the law firm they had together then. So like I remember telling the vice president I was going to Cambridge, and I was like, "Oh, you should go to Harvard instead." We had bantered <laughs> about it and all that. So around this time, he was he had become vice president, and then then the question became. So I started getting invitations just to come back and take a role in government, right? To right. come do policy for the government also. But I was interested because at this point, I was, going to, I was beginning to like this whole idea of I could build a career in international law. Mm. And, and not in international, but in, in international civil service, like mm. work with the UN. But like, it became, and Dr. Duel also became, played a role, big role in this, right? Because she was also taking a role in government at this time. Right. And she kept saying, come back home, come do this role. So I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm young. I'm like, I'm what, 21, 22? What do I have to lose? Yeah. So you were 21 when you were receiving come, come work for the government? Yeah, around 22, 22 23, I think. I think yeah. I was 23 more actively, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think it was 23. So I'm like, you know what, 22? So I, I, so I came and became a special assistant to the president, technical assistant to the president on trade and investment at 23. Mm -hmm. I think probably one of the youngest, right? But the interesting thing was, I couldn't even blow my trumpet, right? Because <laughs> I was in government and government had a lot of old folks and they wouldn't respect you if you're a young guy. So I had to mm -hmm. act older than I was. Like, yeah. I remember one of the first. Things I, I remember two funny things. One of them was first when I resumed work and I saw the vice president. The first joke he made was, "Stay on the straight and narrow." That was like, <laughs> right? But the second one was, was how every person, mental figure, says something like, "Listen, they can't know your age because you're so young. Mm. So like, they won't respect you. Like, you're gonna have, they're gonna give you grief. So like, act older, mm. blah blah blah." So like. I had to wear like suits a lot and then <laughs> switch to wearing trad and then you know so I, I like so yeah, I couldn't yeah. even brag about oh this young guy in government like it was I was just like doing the work and I think that for the longest time I was probably one of the even till now probably one of the youngest people who entered when I was doing technical work because mm. I was doing like I was doing work on trade investment and like trade and investment and industry right so it was and I think we even designed that entire portfolio because then they didn't exist things like a trade investment and industry portfolio at the presidency yeah. so a lot of work around like 
um, advising on the automobile policy for the country, advising on, like, for instance, one of the ones people who wrote the memos that Nigeria shouldn't sign the European Union and West African um, Economic Partnership Agreement. So just kind of like technical Take work. Forward, like, yeah. um, also, I remember reviewing the automobile policy and saying I wasn't going to work because of a bunch of reasons, the textile policy, all that things. But two big things happened at this point. The first was ease of doing business, right? Um, so ease of doing business was important because what really happened was that we, we, the World Bank had come to visit, right, about around that time, the Vice President's office, and I said something like, um, ease of doing business, Nigeria is really down, it's not mm. working, what do you guys want to do about it? And what happens most times is that those meetings happen when people just write, take the notes, and like, yeah, okay. sure, and yeah. go. But like, myself and Dr. Joel were like, this, this actually is a really serious big deal, yeah. right? So we, we started reviewing the documentation, what was possible, and we just took off, because for, for starters, the first thing Nigeria was happening was that Nigeria was just not submitting its own work, right? Because, <laughs> because the thing was like, a good chunk of it was just, we're not even submitting the reports, right? Like, mm. And then what started happening was that I, we started in some intern reports, right? We just, ob and just like updating the work, following the methodology, we moved 24 ranks mm. of the World Bank ranking in the first year, mm. right? And I did that for like two, three years, uh, two, two and a half years really, helping set up the ease of doing business mechanism for the country. We got it approved at the Federal Executive Council. It was good. But around the same time, I then, man, restless guy, <laughs> I then started writing this whole article about how. So what happened was because we also had advice on like trade, whenever people negotiated trade deals, they'll send it down to for us to review. Yeah. And then I'm like, why are there so many agencies sending trade things now? Like today is the Ministry of Works, tomorrow is the Ministry of Housing. Like why are these many people negotiating? Mm -hmm. So I written this memo about how I think about 48 different agencies when negotiating before the federal government. I remember when we presented to the vice president, he said something like, listen, this problem had been there since when he was a young person, right? Because he was also an aide to the attorney general. So we're like, you know what, maybe we should create a de dedicated trade office for the country. Exactly. I was like, you guys should go do it. At that time, another mentor figure, it, was, it wasn't a mentor figure, but it became a mentor figure, who was now late, Ambassador Chiro Osakwe, had moved from the WTO, he had been the most senior director at WTO, and moved back to Nigeria to right. advise um, the Minister of Trade. and. We decided, to set this, we decided that it was best to set this office up and he should head the office. So we wrote the memo and I became like the first staff at the office, right? Mm. Like, so I was made as stand chief negotiator for Nigeria, I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I was like 25, 24, 25. I was yeah. like, I stand chief negotiator for Nigeria. And we set up the trade office. So I moved from working on ease of doing business to working entirely on yeah. trade. And while we're there, we're 25, 26, um, we then around 26, we negotiated the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Now, for context, Nigeria shared the entire negotiation of the AFCFTA. The yeah. reason is that prior to that, the AFCFTA had existed, but Nobody was negotiating, it was just like a mandate given. But like Nigeria, and Nigeria was shared at all the levels. There were three levels of negotiation, the technical working group, the negotiating forum, and the ministers of trade. And Nigeria was shared at the three levels. And we churned out an agreement in one year. By 2018, we had the ACFT agreement, right? Um, and now, I think I'm a bit too restless because <laughs> Yeah, you're recounting your story. Yeah, yeah. And so we're done the ASCF, yeah, and that was like great. And that became like a big deal. And, and one thing I think was also interesting in my life, right, was that it seemed like the things I went to do became the trend, right? So like yeah. when I did um, um, ease of doing business was the trend around the country. I watched that ease of doing business. When I went to do trade, it became okay, OAFCFTA. Yeah. FCFTA. So I've been really lucky with my career. Like I've been lucky. And by the way, none of the things that I apply for, right? I was yeah. like, I was either the one designing them out or like writing them out. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that, which is one of probably one of my favorite quotes, that the best way to create the future, the best way to, to predict the future is to design it or to create it, right? Because yeah. that's really what happened, right? The number of times was like, I just went on to do stuff, and then they became like the big yeah, deal at that what? time. Um, and so, um, so. We did AFCFT. Now, around this time, I said my E started talking a lot about trade, about tech, yeah. right? More actively. Um, started throwing things around, started working around. This was years after you had already started doing um, something. Yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. So by this time, I'm now, in all this time I was talking about, I was still doing work in the ecosystem, but it was sort of either I was investing or I was advising someone on like a transaction. And for context, tech wasn't this cool then, right? Like, yeah. It wasn't cool. <laughs> so, like, because it wasn't cool, people like weren't getting like as funded, mm -hmm. and people couldn't pay like fancy lawyers, mm -hmm. and people weren't raising like the money we're raising now. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was like I was a guy who would like look at their term sheet for them regardless. If I then we didn't used to do a lot of sales, it used to be a lot of price rounds, <laughs> yeah. right? Like because like, when I remember it, I remember there used to be a lot of term sheets, right? Like there was not a lot of like safes and all that. It was yeah. a lot of like term sheets. 
And so, but I'd done this. Now, so we're, at this time, we're around like 2018, 2019. Um, and myself and Ian said, you know, so Ian started Future Africa, yeah. right? Before it started as, started as Street Capital, mm. then became Future Africa, and then I became like the first legal the partner. Department. We co-founded together with a number of other persons um, to like build out like um, the company that became um, um, Future Africa. And then we just, and I think just took off. And, and I think what was at this point very interesting was, I built all this career in public policy and mm -hmm. was a sharp pivot. Now I was like just doing court tech yeah. work. And but at this time I was I was just doing this as a soft thing because I was still actively in government. Mm -hmm. And after a while I'm like, you know what? Maybe I like this more than this government thing that mm -hmm. I'm doing. Because I I'd also gotten bored and restless with the fact that because also the thing was we're done the AFCFTA, but like a lot of the implementation that needs to happen wasn't happening because there wasn't people weren't building the infrastructure you needed because mm. what the AFCFT is in the end is a law, it's a framework. But like someone needs to go to build out yeah. the private sector framework. It's like saying, I've said you can trade, but someone has to go build an Amazon, right? Like, mm. like it's one thing to say, oh, you can get your things through the border, but someone has to build a Shopify. Mm. And I, I didn't think people were building that, so I moved and then started working like investing in um, with, with in Future Africa, like helping design. Something. And would you say that one of the reasons why you decided to like do Future Africa and just focus on it was because you felt tech was then a way to then build the companies that would have yeah, made laws? Yeah, yeah. So if I, our team at Future Africa at that time was um, funding innovators that were solved, that were turning Africa's biggest challenges to opportunities, right? Because mm. the idea was um, that. So I think there were four, maybe two, three things, right? The first was that you had a situation where. There was a lot of things I needed to build on the continent, but there was no capital to build it, mm. right? And with this, people would bring in money from abroad, allowing you actually take money to solve your own big problems in your country. Yeah. Two was that you could actually create incredible prosperity for a lot of millions of people mm. at a goal, right? And I think we didn't have that kind of opportunity before now. So it was like it was like this was the thing to go do now. Yeah. And I think the third thing that was important about Future Africa was, was also the core call of the team. Like for instance, people don't realize for the first year of Future Africa, I think none of us got salaries. <laughs> Like, like because because the thing was like it was a core set of people yeah. who were just like crazy about this idea of what was possible, and you know it was and it was Dami Maiwa, Adeni Kebinja, people which were, were, were like a lot of people getting yeah. salaries. It was just the we could do this. So in fact, a number of things we were, were taking all the capital and just investing, mm. right? And things just took off. Like things just took off from there, um, and. Future Africa got stable, um, but then something it turns out happening because I'd done the AFCFTA and I'd done and I was in, in future after investing. Yeah. What's that happening was people were coming to me every day to say, listen, you know this ASCAT thing, please walk me through it. So, mm. but the first incident that happened, I think it was 2019, there was this Boston Tijani, CCO, wanted to do this event in Kigali. And he invited me down, and, and obviously, of course, it was also then. It was like, listen, this ASCAT thing is, is going to happen. We signed you already. What does it mean for us as an ecosystem, right? And then we had come up with a lot of ideas of how we could implement it for the tech ecosystem, and then COVID happened. So everyone went quiet, mm. and we just all retreated. But like, around 2021, one, it started coming up again. Like 2020, 2021, people were like, I'm trying to expand this market, so I can help me. I'm trying to get into this market, so I can you support me. I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? So at first, Chris was like, I was still doing future Africa work, right? Yeah. I was sending a ridiculous bill. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> pay this amount. And they're like, oh, thanks. And they'll pay. I'm like, what's going on here? Like, it's like, <laughs> right. But like, what I didn't realize was that there was a massive demand, right? Mm. Because what happened was, there was this big market that existed on the continent. People couldn't access the market easily. Mm. And then, and they were getting well-funded. So the idea was that there were well-funded companies who were solving very important problems and then they solve things on the continent. And then, so as I seen the need for, for, for my, my core invention, Nobis, right? Because what happened was that, as we started building this thing consistently, we started and supporting people to like expand to markets. I started seeing this recurring team of people trying to get, get access to markets mm -hmm. that they couldn't get access to. And then that became what became Nobis. And I think we had like four validating factors mm. that made me know that. And what were the four factors? All right. So I'll say the four factors. The first was um, customers. Like before we ever launched, we had $40,000 in revenue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like it was customers. Like we yeah. had customers actually coming out to say that, listen, I want this need yeah. and I'm actually ready to pay for it. Like mm. it, was, it was a big, big need. And we had pipelines of people that still wanted the same service before we ever launched. I think the second big validating factor was my co-founder, Tokwe mm. Obanla. Um, so Tokwe was a senior engineer at Microsoft. I think one of the, right, in Seattle actually. So like, 
I think it was either the second or third engineer of the Microsoft Teams product. Hmm. So like pretty senior guy, building from zero active users to 20 million daily active users. Hmm. And was also at the time was that he left to come join to build Norbase was on the Mesh product, which is like Microsoft's idea of the metaverse. Yeah. So pretty senior engineer type guy. And yeah. easily one of the best minds. I think it's one of my best gifts of a person. Hmm. Um, one of the best minds I have. So it was you guys of, meet? If I tell you, you're gonna laugh. <laughs> Clubhouse. <laughs> Yeah, we had worked together on the, during the whole NSAS thing. Mm. We had done a lot of work together, and we just like it just took just up from there. Yeah, yeah and, and it's crazy because like we get each other a lot. Like mm. I'm more intense, he's more calm and calculated. So it's like a very perfect combo, right? Uh, um, yeah, but like um, yeah. So, so your co-founder was the second validating second factor. Second validating factor. I think the third validating factor was was the quality of investors we started getting. Right. Mm. So what's happening was that we didn't went to raise and then we started getting all kinds of like inbounds, right? Like, oh, I'm interested in investing. I like this idea. Like, because we had, we got investors who understood the problem like mm. very, very fast, right? And so what it meant was that we're trying to raise, we're trying to raise um, a certain amount. I think in the end we had like four times, the, eight times the commitment, right? So it was like, it was like crazy. Like yeah. we had like, yeah, we had, I think we had commitment, we had in commitments almost almost four million dollars of people trying to invest in like mm. well, we had to decline money because that's mm. like we said we don't need we, we don't, don't need that it, much yeah. money so how much did you guys eventually raise i'll tell you eventually <laughs> wait, wait for the <laughs> wait, wait for the raise announcement <laughs> 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 Wait for the reason, no. but like so. Um, but but funny thing is like, and that's the thing also I like about the team. Our team, we're very we're so focused on work and not the aesthetics, right? Because mm -hmm. we've raised for like a while now. We just haven't even remembered to announce, right? Mm -hmm. Because like we're just so busy like working and building mm -hmm. um, as a team, and yeah. But like. So that's the top B, yeah. the quality of investors. We had investors spread across the continent, across the world. Like, because for us, we're cherry picking investors. For the question for us was, what's the value out of this investor? Mm. What exactly are you going to bring to the table for us? Mm. Right? Are you going to help with tech? Are you going to help with like network and this? Because we're building a Pan African product, mm -hmm. actually a global product from the get go. Right? Like, most people get the chance to build a product can be in one place, but like our product was global from the get go, mm. and, and that mattered. And I think that the third thing, the fourth, the last validating factor was the quality of the team. Right, like, so we started trying to hire people and the culture people that like, will just tell the story. Because one thing we were conscious to do when hiring anybody was to tell the goal of Norbase, like what we're mm. trying to build. And every time we told the story, people were like, you know what, I'm on board. We poached someone from like United Capital, like like a senior guy, you know, we had done 13 years of process engineering. <laughs> like we poached someone like from one of the biggest leading law firms in the country. Like we poached, so like the quality of engineers, all engineers, like we, all our engineers got interviewed, like senior Microsoft people and passed the test. Like, so it was like a quality test. So I think for me it was like, you know what? We can definitely do we this. Can, we can, like, like, if anyone should do this, it was. And I think the thing also was the way, there were four reasons why I thought Norbiz was the most important thing to go build. And I think why I think it's the most significant business in the ecosystem, right? So the first is this. If you want to build widely successful businesses, you need access to large markets, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you need, but the thing is, so that's why in, in the US you can say I'm trying to build a burger brand and build a unicorn in San Francisco just be, just selling burgers. Mm -hmm. But like the problem we have with the continent is that the markets are kind of small, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got like and also a lot of them are like markets where the disposable income is not as big as you want it mm -hmm. to be. So if you're building a big business, if you do Lagos, in Nigeria, if you do Lagos, maybe Abuja, maybe Putako, you kind of run out of market space, right? So you have to like, maybe go to Accra next, Ghana, yeah. or go to Nairobi. So that's the first issue. So if I could give you access to a larger market, because you're already There's taking big risk. There's just yeah. one chance that you build a big yeah. success. Second thing is that regulators here are crazy, right? Like, right? <laughs> the thing is like, um, you could be, you can wake up one morning and just because the minister announced it, your business is now illegal, mm -hmm. right? So like, mm -hmm. so like, the only way to build anti-fragility into your business is to be a lot of markets, which is why you notice that when the crypto ban happened, crypto companies survived because yeah. by nature most of them are cross-border. Yeah. But on the other hand, businesses that were like maybe in mobility in one country died because like it's just yeah, harder to exactly. like, right? The third big thing, right, is that. Africa is a na more natural market for like expansion. Like we're talking of 1.2 billion people, a three mm. trillion dollar market. You're talking about the fact that you've got all these people who um, have similar situations, right? A large population, youth population, all of that, right? And so, if you build a solution in Nigeria, the chance that you could scale it into say Ghana was a lot easier. Mm. I think the last thing also was the game theory, right? The idea is that. Regulators today don't have an incentive to help you build, to help provide the best environments because you're kind of stuck. Like, if you're a Nigerian, you're a Nigerian. Like, yeah. you kind of have to launch a company in Nigeria. You don't have a choice. But, like, imagine I give you a world where 
you could actually just pick the market you wanted to go to and based on the market that favored you the most. Mm -hmm. And that's why Nobis was born. Nobis was basically saying, listen, could we build the technology stack? And we, and we say we're a trade tech company, right? Could we build the technology stack that allows anybody to actually just build a global business from the get-go that allows you set up in any market, get a bank account in that market, register a company, register your trademark, um, get an address, whatever it is that you need to be able to set up in any market on the legally. continent legally be, and be ready to go to market licenses. Could I build it for you in a quick stack, like almost mm -hmm. automate that process for you, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're also even doing the US, right? Because yeah. the idea is that, and the reason why the US is important is that most of our ecosystem players are raising capital from the US. Yeah. And we think that the market, and we, it's interesting the demands we're getting, right? Like. We've been growing 100% month on month for the last five months, right? With revenues of 40% growth month on month for the last four months. Because there's so much demand, right? Like this, and the reason is because there's just so much to do. Mm. You're talking about businesses who are trying to solve like life-changing, innovating things on the continent. Yeah. And saying someone could just allow you to be in any market at the yeah. goal. Imagine just make it, it so much easier just make for it easier. focus on exactly. delivery. Exactly. Culture. Just focus on like growing your business, yeah. focus on like building your team yeah. and, and not have to worry. And the thing also is that there's also so much learnings, right? So because what we've done is, and that's why Tokwa is like a fantastic person. So my instinct at first was give people a lot of information. But Tokwa said something, Tokwa's instinct was listen, a good product should guide people, mm. not front load them with information. And so what we ended up doing was building a product where we just guide you through the product, right? So the idea is that you want to set up a company in, Ghana, in Kenya today. There are two ways I could do it. My own way would have been to say something like, you know what, let me give you a lot of information. Something like, oh, these are the five things you need, the 20 things. But people don't like to read. Yeah. So like, people are going to make mistakes. But what if what I did was guide you to the product? Say, listen, what's the name of the company you want to set up? You give me the name of the company. I tell you things like, okay, are you a local citizen? You're not. Oh. That means you need to get a KRP pin, mm. but we can provide a KRP for you immediately without you having to leave this platform mm. for a fee, mm. KRP. Oh, you need an address, you have one? No. We can and that's what we do with the product. Mm. Basically, figure out all the so other things that will affect you. Walk through, basically. Walk through. But through the product, like you just fill, you're, just filling, you're just filling information. Yeah. And whatever information you don't have, we, we'll yeah, provide for you. We'll go sort out, sort it out for you, right, in any market that you want. And it's just been remarkable. That's since. amazing. So you've told me a very amazing story. <laughs> kind of like last 12 years of your life ish yeah. <laughs> going from secondary school um science students to art students um top of your class so you have to act new men there <laughs> 5.0 in unilag i'm first class student going to cambridge um moving to the netherlands to have that first job moving to government like it's you've done a lot <laughs> right I'm and, lucky. yeah i mean yeah <laughs> But you've also had really good people, right? Because yeah, as you talk and you picture all this person, it just says, oh yeah, I'm not just if it's not just me, right? I'm a product of the people that yeah. sort of like, you know, guided me through this. So like, lovely story. Um, and this, it shows a lot of experience, right? You are doing this now. Yeah, I mean, you are, people would say, oh, Tola is the best person to be nerd based because you have the experience of international and commercial and government and trade, all of that stuff. So amazing experience. But now that you're doing startup, right? We are not doing government, you're not advising countries you're not you know writing thesis anymore you're actually building your own business you're not even just like oh i'm a legal partner i have stock i would just like you're doing you're the ceo it's headache what, what would this have been like the biggest challenges that you didn't expect like lord did not prepare you for government like and you're like oh wow this is really startup i'm doing that has kind of really been challenging what was like the top one or two things how much you have to depend on people Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, but why is that challenging? Because you always had people all three. No, yeah, but like the difference is this, right? The difference is now you have a team. So, before, so I think one thing no one talks about is how a startup is basically people holding technology up, right? Like, because, like, you set this growth target, right? And then you have to find this set of people who are as crazy about that dream as you are. You have to incentivize them to care as much about it. You have to marshal them to have the same points. They're going to have things in their personal life. You have to show that you care about them. It's actually a lot. Like, no one talks about how being a founder is 90% managing people. Mm -hmm. Just like, forget the goal, forget the, like, it's actually, because the thing is, because like, I think I'm a great salesman, but the thing is, the capacity to you to scale the business as one person is incredibly limited, mm -hmm. right? But like, if you can design a set of people that are just like yourself, building the system, you have a good tech, you can actually do crazy things. Like, I think that a company with the best set of people and good technology can do magic. Mm -hmm. right? we, we, some people say at Nobis, we say that we're going to make expansion 
and setting up looked to you as though it was magic, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, but that, that works because there's a team. And I think that's one thing I didn't foresee. Because the thing is, in most of the places I always, I always worked before, whether I was, was at, the, at the OPCW or at the government, people had their incentives aligned for yes. a specific reason. Like, in, in government, I was working at the presidency, right? What happened in this case, so you have all this stack of people who, um, also have their own portfolios, have their own appointments. And so the truth is, most of the time you just have to go and find, or even you're trying to convince a minister to do something, you have to find an incentive the minister cares about yeah. and amend the incentives. But the difference here is that now you're running the entire company of people who are, yes, and by the way, that's one reason why in not base everyone has equity. Like mm. everyone has equity. Like we're intention of giving everyone equity and an equity that you can actually exercise at the point. In fact, the way we design is that we design that when we do become a unicorn, everyone will help build, well, I have at least a million dollars in mm. like, um, right, and so people hiring. We want to know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yes, we're always hiring. We're, we're actually crazily hiring right now. But um, but yeah. So the, the thing, so that matters a lot for us. Yeah. But like, and I think that's what I did not see as much. Mm -hmm. How much of your time you spend actually just managing people? Like, we we do one on ones with everyone. Like, I, I try to do one on one with everyone once every two weeks, just to know where's the state of mind, how are they doing, do they feel at home here, and there's something we need to change. And you just spend a lot of time. And then people. But even partnerships, like you have to yeah. have a partnership with like other other companies, like people's just like it's a all about lot it. Lot of like it's, it's a lot. Like yeah. you're like the days I wake up, I don't want to talk to anyone. But like you have <laughs> you to have talk to, to people. Yeah. yeah. So then you're the like, challenge aside people. Yeah. So that's one. I think the second thing will be that prioritizing something means deprioritizing something else. Hmm. Right. So one of the things that I think has happened over the last few years with tech is that. We've sold this narrative that tech is magic, mm. where we always make it look like tech can do everything. You know, like, oh, just do this tech stack. And I think engineers are to blame for it. <laughs> like, they sold this story of, oh, the tech can do everything. But like, truly, this tech is actually incredibly limited, right? I, th I think we wouldn't talk about the roles of product designers enough. Mm. Like, designing the workflow of mm. what an experience should look like for a customer. But like, but what you also realize is that, so when we're building at first, right, I used to have all these things I wanted to, like, I have this great idea, and I'm just like, we've got to do this. And they're like, oh, so what are we prioritizing in the list of things you already have to mm. do? I'm like, what? We have to like, prioritize something? Yeah. yeah. And I think that was like a big challenge too, because it just meant now you have to validate mm. why you're doing everything you're doing, mm. right? So that was also a big challenge. I think we've been lucky. We didn't have like we didn't have a, a cap. We didn't have money problems, right? Mm. Um, and a good thing also was that yeah, we didn't have money problems. We, we've been we've been blessed with how the quality of teams we got. I think another thing that was that was shocking to me is how you could come under fire for what you know nothing about. Can you right? do what? You come under fire for not something. Oh, come under fire. Yeah, so like in the early days of our business, the, the, someone came for us saying, you know, Pedro not kind yeah. of lies. That we, we didn't even get a chance. We weren't even pre-informed that, yeah. that there was an incident. We didn't even know anything about it, right? We're like, we're blindsided by the, like, I woke up like everybody else and there was this so news. <laughs> like, what's going on? Yeah. So I, I think that's also the thing that's shocking to me, right? How you're now, you're, because you're trying to build a business for everyone, you now can have a target on your back mm -hmm. and you can't do anything about it. Like you just mm -hmm. go every day open that, like it pans out well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like three things, like people like, managing people is like a lot of work. Yeah. The tech is also very limited. Like tech can do a lot of things. Like tech, tech, in fact, the truth is, the best way to build businesses is to do things that can scale mm -hmm. first and then find a way to use tech to scale them. Right, yeah. right, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Is there anything that you would change if you go back and you see where you've come to right now? Is there anything you change in your journey? Especially since like most of them happen just based off of I know this person, this person said this. Is there any one that you'd have said okay yes to or no to or just done it a bit differently? So so I, I used to say that I would have wanted to start my company a lot earlier. But the truth is I don't know if that's true, right? Because <laughs> the truth is because when I look at my career, so I've had an incredibly fantastic career, right? Mm -hmm. Where where yeah, where like if I didn't have the stack of experience, I probably wouldn't have been able to do the things that I did. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's that's the mix of it, right? But like, if I could do anything, maybe I would want to start Nobis or any company, tech company that I've built like a lot faster. But I also think it's perfect timing because like, I built this career that built up to this moment. But apart from that, like, I've had, like I make a joke that um, I'm a Christian and I make a joke that I think that God is like showing off with my life. Because <laughs> yeah. like, I've had like a re really, really yeah. kind life. Like, I've had a really, really kind life. Like. I don't take it for granted. Like I, I don't take it for granted at all. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. Like, yeah. I, 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 I think hard of like 
what my also has been, like what the tough time has been, I can't think of it. Like, mm. I've actually had a very, very kind life and I'm incredibly thankful for that. I'm grateful for you as well. I'm yeah. praying to get some grace. <laughs> it's like, in case you want to lay hands on this, like, pass it along. When, when we started the interview, one of the things that you said you learned very early on when you were in high school was just that you can use words to finish your way through life. A lot. Yeah. As a CEO, now this is fine as it's true. <laughs> So, so yes and yes and no. So, I think the the thing you learn as a CEO, right, is you've got to be honest with words. So, I think early in life you learn that words work and words do work a lot. But like words work easily when in most of the situations it's one-off situation. You're writing an exam, the exam isn't going to see you after that class, right? You can finish your way. But the thing with being a CEO and like building life is that you have repeat experiences, like. If you're signing a partner, you're gonna to have to do with that partner consistently. If you're hiring someone to work for you, you're gonna to have to hire the person. That person's gonna work with you. And so your words have to mean a lot more mm. than they did before. So you can't and just be bullshit. You can't just be eloquent. And so I think the big thing for me, and my, and my team still reminds me of that a lot, that, okay, we promised this. Can we deliver all of the things we promised, right? What does mm. it mean for us? And what and, and it goes back to the question of when you prioritize something, it means you're deprioritizing something. So we'll, so we'll make this grand promise. Yes, we can do it, but what does that mean for us mm. from an execution's point of view? What then do we have to deprioritize? Mm. And I think that's like the big thing for me. It's that words can do a lot, but like words also mean you have to be incredibly responsible because it means that people take like people your words and there's something that Topper reminds me a lot about, which is that there's already power dynamics in your favor, right? Mm. And you've got to be careful about that when you engage. Because the thing is that like your words mean a lot. Like if a partner who is depending on you to deliver a product. Your words mean a lot to that person. Mm. For a customer who is dependent on you to like do his setup for him or his corporations or his um, or his bank accounts, the words mean a lot to him. For your um, cost, for your staff or your team members who are saying things, we're, we're like we're holding the words that you give them. To, your words mean a lot, mm. and like constantly trying to remember the words you say, like. One thing that, that's become, that affects the balance for me these days is not saying things until I'm absolutely sure that I can I deliver on it. Because it's a, sometimes also a lot difficult, right? Because in the moment, like, so for instance, someone asks you something, the moment you want to say something, you're like, listen, maybe you shouldn't. And like, because I, I also always like to be Mr. Nice Guy, right? A lot of times. So one thing I have to learn is it's fine to say things like, listen, I wish I could do this, but, right but I don't know yet. Yeah. Give me some time to think about it and come back to you. Yeah. And just be like honest with your words. Yeah. It's like, yeah. That makes sense. Thank you for that. Um, and so, something else you said very early on, you said that one of the fundamentally most annoying experiences of your life was when the other classmates said you were part of the bullies and you were not. And that's yeah. one of the reasons. They didn't say I was bullies, you just said I was there. there. Yeah, so I it was like I was aiding and abetting the crime. Right. And, uh, yeah. and you said that's one of the reasons why you still like justice. And we think back to like 2020 and who ends us and you were really in the middle of just helping people how how do you still do how, how has that shaped what you have become because when we think when you started that i was going to be like oh did you do any form of criminal law but you went into like trade and investments and all of that but i mean just to stay really core part of who you are i just want you to touch a little bit about that so it did, it did dramatically change me i i lost relationships right i lost like I had mental figures that we kind of had a falling out as a result of it. Because like it was taking a stand. So, but the thing was this. So when enters happened, I, I remember that I got involved in the bit accidentally. What happened was the set, first stack of people that got arrested at Abel Kuta. They were trying to get them out of prison at I think at 11 p.m. Like, we thought it was six of them. Mm. And myself, FK or chats in FK was like, we're trying to get these people, can get a doc, can get a lawyer. And then we I got a, I tr we tried to get lawyers that night. And then we found out there was actually 30 something people. We thought it was six and it was 30 something people. And it was like, and I just got crazy annoyed. I'm like, Wait, wait, what happened? Right. We thought six people were arrested, and I was telling something. And I think what was worse for us was the encounter. Like, first, the police would deny these people were arrested. Now, we find out that they were there, they'll tell you that you have to go and bring the list of the people. How am I supposed to get a list of people I don't even know? Mm. Then, the next thing they'll tell you is that, oh, this list of people, they'll tell you things like, some of them, they'll tell you things like some of them committed murder. Like, you're still crazy offense. I'm like, this guy was arrested yesterday for being a protest site. Like, how did he commit murder? And, and, and I think that way I realized that one of the things that was going to happen in this protest was, and I think I did a tweet about it, was they're going to use the law to victimize people. So I did a tweet saying, listen, if you want to be on this network of lawyers I'm putting together, and it just became, it just took off from there. People yeah. just jumped on it. If I think, someone had to remind me after I was to create a link. Because I didn't think, I was like, <laughs> DM me. And my DM was a mess. So I had to create a link, and then it just took off. Um, but then it's, I think for me was, one was, I, making the show was a bit easy, because I, I felt I was privileged. And in my head, I felt like, for me, the worst that this means is, someone's pissed at me. Mm. Right, because I was activist in government. I was yeah. at the press. I was still working. At, I was a yeah. chief negotiator for the Nigeria and yeah. head of trade remedies for the trade office at this time. But like my own thinking was, 
for someone else, that means that they actually might spend their life in jail and get lost in the system for mm. doing nothing. And so that meant a lot to me to say, listen, I'm gonna sh like do as much as I can. Mm. I think the second thing for me was, I, it's what you read all these things about injustice, but it's a dramatically different thing when you see it in a real person's life. Like when you know this person was protesting yesterday and was fine, and mm -hmm. now we can't find him in the system, and now he's facing a murder charge in the court, and he's having to show up in the court of law for six months, and his finances are going down the drain. Um, and so it was like it dramatically changed me because I, I realized how life could happen to anyone, or Nigeria could happen to anyone, and that was like a bit scary, and it just made me realize I had to do, I, I, I had had to to do, do more about yeah. what I could. But I think the third thing for me was also realizing that you could build things at scale, right? And you yeah. had to build things at scale. And I think, interestingly, when I think of Norbis, a lot of the learning also was from that time, right? Because what happened to the, the things you had to learn from scale, right? So one of the things we're working on now, and I hope we, we should turn it out, is how to build this kind of network in a more lasting structure, mm. right? But like, because it's one, because I was, so I was very careful not to center myself in all of this yeah. and become like a celeb or whatever. It, is. it was a very easy thing to go do, right? Yeah. For me, it was it was like these are real lives, and you can't like you can't commercialize yeah. like that situation and try and make yourself the star of the show, right? But what was more important was because we could have kept it going, right? And saying things like, oh, we're helping, but like the question was, is this system sustainable, right? Can you build a system out of it that works? And so it was the, can we pan down what we're doing right now and just go figure out the right way to make this work in a more mm -hmm. permanent system? Of course, also lessons we learned, how not to take donations and what kind of donations to take. Well, no, it was big lessons. Yeah. Because like, listen to important like, lessons that you don't think are important, yeah. but they are like, yeah. what kind of donations should you take? For instance, I tweeted something recently and I, was, and I was saying that the goal is to get so rich you can help, you can, do things that change millions of lives without raising capital. Mm. Right? And I, that's actually a big goal for me right now. Like mm. to make the kind of money that means that you can change millions. Like that's why I build gates a lot. I like that <laughs> one man can say, I want to kick out polio and from the world and I just kick it. out polio. Or yeah. say, I want to fight global poverty yeah. and just find out fight global poverty. Yeah. Being able to like, and, and yeah. So like, yeah, so, that's, that's, so I, did, I didn't study any of these things, but like, I'm a quick study and I'm great with process and, and operations. Like I'm great with designing operation processes. And then I think I'm also pretty cool at like motivating people <laughs> to, to do things, right? So yeah, so I think it was all that together. It was just, so, because when I think of Intas, I, I wasn't actively like going to the court of law or something. I just, yeah. I just, I had relationships. I knew how to like call a minister if someone was in trouble or call yeah. a governor or access like someone I could get to. And then I could also co coordinate the lawyers. So I, so I was like being a bridge. Like was a, okay, I'm, someone is stuck in trouble. I'm going to get my lawyers to go there quickly. And the lawyers are there. I'll be like, okay, this person's in mm -hmm. trouble. Oh, the police is not getting them. Okay, who's the, who's the commissioner in charge of that? Who's the attorney general? Who's the governor? Who's the minister? And I just cascaded it. So yeah, it was, okay. yeah, yeah. My final question. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier as well was that by by the time you're 23, 24, um, when you're still in camp, you're already advising tech startups. That's 2021. Uh, yeah, 2021. <laughs> wow. You're already advising tech startups, and obviously, I mean, you're building your own company now, so you have like a world of experience just from the legal side of things for tech startups. Um, so for people who have not had experience with you or have a relationship with you, come and say, hey, Tola, come and help me look at this. What would you say is the most important advice you would give to a startup founder or someone who wants to be a startup founder from the legal points of view, right? And then the last question after that is, and the last one is, um, you said a lot, and one of the things I really liked about this conversation is, at every point in your life, you kind of mention like the one or two key experiences and lessons. So there's a lot of lessons. Like this kind of video, someone will watch and be like, he said this thing, and they watch another segment, and then there's just so many lessons. But what's one thing you would want someone to forget? Like if you say, like you watch everything, and yeah, you, this, this was really amazing, but it's one thing I don't want anybody to forget from that. So one, advice to founders from a legal point of view, and then two, just anybody that watches this video, you want one most important thing you don't want, to, you don't want them to forget. It could be a lesson, it could be a challenge, it could also just be about your life and your experience. That's hard, that's me on the spot. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I'll start with the first one, because that's probably a lot. What's the few things that I think founders who have no legal background should think about? Um, I think one is that It's hard. <laughs> Thoughts. Okay. okay. I think the first thing I'd say is that um, read as much as you can about like there are a lot of good books and materials these days, like videos that you can read about like starting up. Like don't don't rush it, right? Like ah, that's it. Don't don't be don't be in a rush to sign anything. Like don't mm. be in a rush to sign anything. Like that's like the first thing. Like I've seen too many deals 
or people's businesses get messed up because they sign something in their start early stage of their careers. Like, don't be in a rush to sign anything, right? Like, go get as much. So right now, there are a lot of books. There's a book, Venture Deals. It's probably one of the best VC books you can ever read. Um, like, read as much as you can about, like, the things that you want to, like, get involved in, right? Like, there's, there's, there's a lot of, like, materials online that you can yeah. get. Yeah, there's as even a cost of Venture Deals. Well. Exactly. So that's like understand how, understand how, and, also, and that's one, right? I think the second thing that's important is for people that want to go to startup, understand how the, understand the motivation of VCs. Mm. A VC is investing for two reasons, right? One is that they want to make a massive upside or profit from what you're building. But the thing is also there is that they want you to build a massively successful business mm. at a very fast speed. Like so. You, the idea of VC is not to go build a slow business that mm. takes your time. Or your, like the idea is to grow, it's blitz scaling, to grow mm. super fast. And so before you ever raise the first capital, you show that that's what you want to do. Mm. I met one of my favorite investors. Um, she said, she, she said, what do you want to do with this company? Let's clarify, like tell me what you want to build with this company and hope you want to go all the way. Because that's an important question that startup founders want to know. Like mm. if you're just trying to build a small business, maybe don't go the VC route. Maybe go like debt or raise like some small money from friends and like build it and yeah. take your time. But like if you want to go like, because the incentive is like, a, a VC only gains if you go really, really fast, mm. right? So like the incentive that you go fast, you make, you go really, really fast. The, multi, the multiples are clear and they can exit, mm. right? And so they're gonna put a lot of pressure. And so, and so discount any advice any VC gives you for that incentive, because like they're gonna make incentives in decisions based on that. And that's their one number one incentive. Mm. I think the third thing is get a, you gotta get a, as much, like don't, the best, I don't know how to say this, but like don't go cheap on your team. Mm. Don't do it. Like, can hire the best people. Hire the best people that you can afford. Like, I will say hire the best people. I think you can convince the best, any, the best people to join your team, no matter the price. I think if it's an, if, if you have to mix cash and equity, whatever it's like, go get the best people. Like, you cannot. I've seen it happen. I've seen what it means to hire the best hands, and I've seen what it means to hire someone you could manage, and it's a dramatic difference in like the quality of work, the speed at which you can grow, the quality of feedback. Right, and also maybe the fourth thing is build a system where your team can give you feedbacks. Mm -hmm. Right, and one of my favorite things is that when they wanted to kill Jesus, they had to find somebody who knew him to kiss him because they didn't know who was who. Like build a system where people in your team don't feel like there's a there's they can reach you or can access you. Like because you want a feedback, feedback is incredibly important because listen. You would actually die at a startup if you're not if you're not reacting fast enough to data. Mm. Because what happens is that you'll have built something at one certain speed, and then you get to the end and find that you were wrong all along. Like you want people to, have to give you feedback fast. You want people to make mistakes and say, "Oh, that's actually wrong," and kill you fast. Like it's too expensive to be wrong, running on wrong data in a startup. It's just too expensive. So you want to build a system, and so people think that this whole idea where people are scared of you is a good thing. No, actually, you're building a system yeah. where it people are going to give you feedback. false data, yeah. and you're going to destroy your startup because, yeah. like, so it matters a lot. So for free, so well, it's. Don't sign anything too don't, fast. Don't be in a rush to sign anything. Yeah. yeah. Understand what the VC wants and make sure that you're The motivations, in. yeah. Hire the best people and build a system where you can get feedback and then iterate on that feedback it's as well. Pretty fast, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And then one thing I don't want people to forget. That one I don't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what did I want to forget? Uh, uh, I don't think Let I me ask a question in a different way. People know Adito Lavi um, on Twitter. Now we've gotten insight into who you are and your journey and mm -hmm. how you kind of built and how you've gotten to where you want to be. Um, now, when people think about you, how do you want us to think about you differently from just that Twitter guy? Yeah. Okay. I think I want people to think of me as someone who's trying to build life changing things that actually changes lives for millions of people. Like, like when I say things that I want to have the capital to do to change the lives of millions of people without having to raise capital, I actually do mean it. Like I remember that when I was in uni, like I used to say that my goal was to help at least 40 countries move from developing to developed. Mm -hmm. right? Like I actually dramatically want to help people create ridiculous wealth and like help the continent have a better quality of existence. And that matters a lot to me, right? Like. It, it dramatically affects how I lead life, like how I approach life, how I like, how I like organize my life. Because the thing is, the way I think of it is this, life is short for most people, right? If you have a great life, maybe you live 100 years. Well, it's not a long time when yeah. you think of it, right? But like, when you think of it, your first 20 years, you're spending it living for your parents, so maybe 20 something years. You're gonna end up 20 years, maybe when you get to leave, for 10 years when you get to leave for yourself, then the rest you're living for your kids and their family. So the question is, 
even life is really difficult. People just have a bad, ex a bad quality of life yeah. because, like, not only are you juggling so many things, life is just by itself like just demanding. Happen. Yeah. And so, being able to design a system where people in a continent can just live better quality of life matters a lot. Like, where people can, uh, where people can like eat better food, drink better water, um, like have better experience with their families, you know, like just like better quality of life. And that's why I think Nob is incredible. I think I, I tell everybody that it's the most single company on the continent because when we do succeed, you can actually scale our most innovative solutions anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world, right? Like you can basically say this solution works in Nigeria and then just go and scale it in South Africa, Ghana, get code everywhere, anywhere, yeah. right? And I think that what we're building is digital infrastructure that makes it easy for any business or any innovator or any entrepreneur to actually just get this life-changing innovative things they're doing to every part of the world. And it matters dramatically that we succeed at it, right? And so, yeah, and I, so I, I say it's an issue of when we do it, not if we do it, because we will do it, right? It's just an issue of, like, and we're going way on that part. Um, but yeah, but, but like, and for me it's that everything everyone can do anywhere, to just ensure people have better quality of life, does matter, right? Because like, like life, like, most of the incentives we have are not important anymore. Like, when, when you die, like, yeah. when you think of it, like, you're dead. Like, what is it that they say bad about your name? You're dead, you really care, you're dead. Yeah. Like, it's not like, like all that matters is now you're alive and what you can do to the next person. Like, all these legacy in incentives are not as fantastic when you think of it in, 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 a, in an extreme sense, right? Like, when people die, they don't really care if you're abusing them. Good yeah. luck to you, right? But like, Imagine you can make someone else's quality of life. And it's also the ripple effect of that. Like, if I make you have a better quality of life, because of that, your kids can have a better quality. One of the things I know I want to do in years to come is build this estate where newly married couples can come and not pay rent for one year. Mm -hmm. Right? And like, just support them for that one year. Because like, there's so much ripple effect. And that's the kind of things I care about. Like, things that can have long-term impact on a millions of people. I think I think in scale of millions. Like, if you got to touch millions, it's probably not worth it. Okay. So, the one thing we remember about you is that you really care about people and you want to just create change and impact as many people as possible. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. No, yeah, yes, we will. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Yes, Amazing. I will. I will tell you what I'm taking away from the story. <laughs> um, I think it's the significance of just learning and learning a lot and just like going deep into whatever it is that you're doing and mm -hmm. even though you've done you've succeeded like really fast in so many different things you talk like there was always a lot of depth and like you really committed yourself to like getting as much more knowledge as yeah, possible yeah. and that just made it easier to get the nest yeah. and get the first class and get the jobs yeah. and also just the importance of just having the right people on your team yeah, the, yeah, yeah. and that the right people. people to support you and to mentor you and then very importantly is just saying yes to opportunities yes I, I think that you lose 100% of opportunities you don't take. Yeah. Like, every time in my life, every opportunity that has come, I don't think I was qualified for them. I just ran it in. Yeah. But things I'm intense. Like, when I'm there, you I'll put in work. 1 million percent. Like, I'll read everything that can be read. I'll talk to everybody that can be talked to. And the thing also is that I don't have ego about, like, I, I don't have ego about winning. So what I mean is, like, see, if I want to win, like, you know what this thing that happens where, let's say for instance, maybe you, you ordered your food, then they annoy you, be like, I'm not eating anymore, I don't do that already. Like, I'm like, okay, if I say I'm not eating anymore. <laughs> it's me that we're It's hungry. me that I'm hungry now. Like, like, I don't have an ego about winning. Like, yeah. if I email someone and I'm trying to get access to something, and you're like, oh, you're not interested, I would reach out 10 times. Like, yeah. the worst, like, I don't like, yeah. I've not gotten what I want. Like, I'll keep like, yeah. I don't have an ego about winning. Like, just, the incentive to me is win, like, just win. Yeah. Like, and, and so like, yeah, so like, I'll just show up every time. Like, and like you said, like, I think I also like consciously learn as much as I can. Like, I ask honest questions. Like, so I like spaces where, and I think it's an important space to also create a startup and in, yeah. in, with the friends that you have, where you can actually have conversations with an with an acceptance that you don't know things. Mm -hmm. Because like, too many times people are playing performance, right? They're, they're yeah. playing performance of I know things when you don't know. Like, you have to ask. Oh, please explain. I actually don't understand what that means. Like, why is that important? Like, and that's one thing that happens. Like, for instance, I joined tech meet in, like a lot of my engineers meetings, and I'm like, wait, why does that but matter? Yes. Like, <laughs> like, like, like yeah. why does that mean, right? And those kind of like, or even business meetings, and I'm like, because there's a semblance to want to act like you know things. Like, I think one of the things you want and to do. And if you don't know it, and you don't ask, you wouldn't know it. And, but the thing is, like, like, you should even not like, you should be worried if you know it. Like, because yeah. why? Like, you've not lived this life before, so how do you know it? Like, do you get like? Because a lot of times. A lot of the things we're carrying around through life are just assumptions mm -hmm. that we've learned. Like, for instance, like, and one thing I do a lot is ask myself, why do I want to do this? Like, okay, you want kids, why do you want kids? You want to marry, why do you want to marry? Like, you want to start a business, why do you want to? Because a lot of things are just assumptions. Like, it's because we do it because we want to do it. Yeah. Especially when you grow up in the Nigerian system, because, like, 
the first 25, 30 years of your life, you're probably just following routes. Like you're yeah. following what they told you to do. Right? And so you learn to just so do curiosity. things because, yeah, so this whole honest question of why exactly does this matter? Like, why should I go apply? For instance, some months, some days ago, I turned down a Stanford offer. So I got an PhD offer in Stanford in 2019, and I was going to take it, right? And I've been deferring it for back to back to back. And I think this, and the, most people will take it because it's Stanford. It's Stanford. But I'm like, listen, I'm building a company right now. I raised capital to go build a company right now. It is not important to go to Stanford right now. Period. And like being able to ask, and a lot of that is just being, and also getting that quality of people that you could ask that same question. So, because yeah. I, I asked most of my closest friends, my co-founder, you know, um, my, my parents, you know, uh, my partner, and just asked all that questions, and just said, listen, you know, what do you think about this? And it was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing. We'll end the video here now. Because I'll be feeling if I say one more thing, Tola would go back <laughs> again. <laughs> but really, it's been an amazing conversation. Just really learning about you and just, you know, learning about your journey. And also, not just learning about you and your journey. I think it's the lessons that you really shared by just sharing your story. That's really important to me. So thank you so much for honoring me. This Thanks for having me. Peace. And thank you guys for watching this video. I know you would enjoy it. Probably just go back and watch it again and be able to pick up every single lesson from here. I'll see you in the next video. Don't this channel to subscribing. Peace out. Peace out. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.